you know, there's a there's a logic to what what we do. And I and I called it the Occam process because, you know, I was influenced uh, first ran across uh, William of Occam when I was in high school, a quote who said, it's vanity to do with more that which can be done with less. And I went, yeah, that makes sense. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Altium On Track podcast. I am your host, Zach Peterson. And today I will be talking with Joe Felstad of Verdant Electronics. Uh, he is probably best known for a solderless uh, process known as the Occam process. Um, this is definitely a change in thought for me. And I think um, it will require a little bit of a change in thought for some designers, but it's a very interesting thing to consider uh, going mainstream instead of traditional soldering for assembly. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for being here today with us. Well, thank you for having me, Zach. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, one thing I, I like to do with uh, folks on the podcast is to uh, get a sense of their background. So maybe you can tell us uh, how you got started in the industry and um, how you uh, got into uh, maybe developing the Occam process and you know where you see it going. Okay. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a drink from a fire hose here today. I'll try to abbreviate it somewhat. But you know, I, I've, I've been in the industry for over half a century. Started out as uh, as basically running a lab. I had been a, a, a lab tech at a company in Silicon Valley, and uh, we were doing analysis on plating solutions for printed circuit board shops. And uh, then one company uh, hired me away to set up a lab for them and run it. So I got to the point where I was doing analysis on everything every day and uh, doing cross-sectioning, doing virtually everything associated with how to analyze the plating solutions and the, you know, and, and the circuit board manufacturing technology. So I got all that done and then I decided I'd better go out and learn how they're actually doing this stuff. So I went out on the floor and started understanding the manufacturing itself from, you know, lamination, electrolysis processes, drilling, everything that was associated with it. And, um, you know, uh, after that, I went into chemical manufacturing for a couple of years, uh, started manufacturing the chemistry that was associated with printed circuit technology at a company called Chemline. And uh, from there, I wound up at, uh, uh, up at Boeing uh, doing uh, process engineering at Boeing Aerospace up in the Seattle area, which is where I am still grounded. The family came here with me and they stayed. I bounced around since. Um, I spent a couple of years with the IPC as educational director, spent a couple of years in um, uh, at a company called Printed Circuit Builders down in Santa Clara, California, where I ran uh, research and development, ran the lab again and did, you know, uh, quality control. I basically always had my hands in every little pie trying to make it all work together. Uh, from there, I, I did a couple of startups. One was called Elf Technologies, where we did uh, extended length flex, building flexible circuits in a real-to-real -real fashion using technologies that are still being played out today. Um, then I got the call from a friend who said, how'd you like to go live and work in the Soviet Union? And I said, sure. So I left for the Soviet Union, went to work at Kurchatov Institute of Atomic Research of all places. They had a small electronics lab. My goal was to basically kind of get them up and running better than what they were. The communist system sucked and um, really kind of unfortunately stole the initiative from really bright people. Um, but you know, while I was there, it went from the Soviet Union to, to Russia. I take no credit for that. But it was an interesting time. That was <laughs> it was an interesting time. That was thirty years ago, and uh, um, I still have a lot of dear friends in Russia and who are greatly distressed by current circumstances. Um, came back, went to work for another startup called Tessera, which uh, uh, we did development for uh, IC packaging technology. Was involved in the development of the micro BGA, the first of the chip scale packages. Um, then went to um, went off to do my own thing. Uh, actually, I went to took a slight uh, hiatus to a friend of mine's consulting company, where we worked on the Land Warrior project, building a soldier of the future. Um, from there, I went off to start my next you know 
a startup was called Silicon Pipe, and that was in 2002. And so that's 30 years ago, 20 years ago. And there we developed a lot of very interesting technologies and concepts that are just now starting to find their way into electronic products. And, um, you know, we called the OTT, the over the top uh, technology for bringing. We basically were talking about 3D partitioning of, of the interconnection process. So based on work that we did at, Silica, at Tesla, rather, um, started seeing things in some new ways and how they can all go together. Uh, those ideas, as I say, are just starting to show up. So, you know, being a little bit ahead of the game is, uh, you yeah, know, it's frustrating, but, you know, it's nice to see the things that you drew showing up elsewhere. Um, and then that kind of sort of petered out. We didn't get the funding that we were looking for. So uh, the company wound up getting sold for the patent portfolios to uh, Samsung, you know, which kind of gave me, uh, how shall I say, something close to minimum wage for the time that I spent there. Over, If you count all the hours of the day, it was, you know, you know, I got a payback on it. And then I started this most recent company, Verdant Electronics, based on the idea of uh, eliminating lead from the manufacturing process. And that was something that, um, uh, you know, I had at first been in favor of lead free when I heard about it, because I'm an old hippie from the San Francisco Bay Area. And then I started doing this, the, you know, the, the scientific analysis of it. And I found that it was bogus, you know, that all the claims were actually not particularly true. In other words, the amount of lead that was being consumed in electronic products represented less than a half percent of all the lead that was being consumed annually. And when you had all the legacy lead all over the world, you know, including on roofs of buildings all over Europe, and you look at the lead morbidity rate, just wasn't there. Lead in gasoline, that was a problem. You know, is that people were actually breathing lead, and most of us were probably lead toxic in the in the '60s and '70s, just if we lived near a city. So I, you know, I fought against the lead-free, you know, cabal, <laughs> if you will, and uh, and then one day after the EU had finally promulgated, uh, you know, the, the the ban on electronics and solder, I um, I wrote down three words, and you know, I wrote columns pretty regularly for the company at the magazine called Circuitry at the time and since morphed into PCB 007. But um, I wrote three words as I was starting to think about what I might write about. And I wrote this, assembly without solder. And I went, bingo, that's it. You know, that solves the problem. And so I have been on that, uh, jousting that windmill, if you will, for the last, uh, you know, 15 years, uh, continuing to you know, say, hey, look, there's a better way to build things. Um, as I've said on numerous occasions, if, uh, you know, I were to have been tele teletransported from Printex, where I worked in in the 19, early 70s, uh, into a printed circuit shop of today and let to wander around, I would be able to get, oh, okay, I get, I understand this process. I understand. I, I would be very impressed with the improvements in terms of technology and manufacturing equipment. But fundamentally, we're doing the same thing. And so I said, you know, we could build these things better if we built them backwards. And uh, in other words, rather than building a circuit board and putting components on it, build a component board and put circuits on it. And with the work that we had done at chip scale packaging, it all suddenly, you know, made sense. You know, there are a billion different packages out there and probably almost as many formats, if you will, the way it's exploded. So anyway, that's a, you know, maybe too long of a, of a journey, but that's that's where I'm at. I'm still on this uh, on this effort, and I refuse to give up. I mean, that's it's a very uh, impressive and, and illustrious career, and um, I I think it's interesting because you're probably the only person I've ever met or talked to who has said anything publicly about being against. ROHS or uh, one of these directives that is meant to ban lead from electronics. Um, I understand what you're saying, though. I, I think, or I think, what you're saying is that this is such a small part of the lead problem. If you are one of those people who consider it a problem, that you know the big problem, as you mentioned, was gasoline 
um, was leaded gasoline, which I think makes perfect sense. So, you know, yeah. that's one of the big problems. Let's solve that. Probably something like lead paint makes sense to solve too. Uh, absolutely. But sure, sure. But if it's such a small piece of the electronics puzzle, then why are you going around banning it? And I mean, with yeah. mill aero electronics, uh, you know, lead free solders are, are not even qualified for in terms of reliability. And that's a big struggle for them right now. I mean, it has been because the thing is, is that, you know, consumer electronics rule the roost and mm -hmm. they make the calls in terms of what it is. You know, I had a dear friend of mine, an advisor was Werner Engelmeyer, you know, known as Mr. Reliability in industry. And, you know, I've sent the what I call the green paper at the time to Werner. And I, you know, here's what I was suggesting. And Werner said, you know, you're going to put me out of business, <laughs> you know. It's Mr. Reliability. I said, well, no, Werner, I'll put you into a new business. Unfortunately, Werner passed away, but but he understood it immediately. And, and I had known Werner since the late 70s. You know, he was at Bell Labs at the time. But, the, you know, there's a there's a logic to what, what we do. And I, and I called it the Occam process because, you know, I was influenced, uh, first ran across uh, William of Occam when I was in high school, a quote who said, it's vanity to do with more that which can be done with less. And I went, yeah, that makes sense. And so you, it's, it's something you apply to your life. I also, you know, as an old hippie, read Thoreau and Thoreau's tagline was simplify, simplify. And, you know, it, it just keeps on coming throughout history. The, the, the concept of simplicity keeps on rising up um, plan of uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, most people remember for the parents perhaps reading The Little Prince to him, which is a fairy tale for children written for adults. In other words, the stories are, are, are best understood by probably adults. Um, anyway, in his book, Wind, Sand and Stars, which is a, sort of an autobiography, uh, autobiography of his um, uh, um, time as a pilot, flying mail back and forth between you know, North Africa and and uh, uh, Spain, and then on into the Andes. Anyway, there was one particular quote that popped off the page there, where he said, uh, the designer knows that perfection in design is achieved, not when there's nothing more that can be added, but nothing more that can be taken away. And mm. this, this just so resonated with me and still today, just to go, God, that's such, I wish I'd have said that. You know, it, it just absolutely, <laughs> absolutely makes sense. Um, and most people don't, I don't get much argument from people when I start talking about these things. I mean, yeah, I, there, I get some protests from the people in the solder industry, of course, why wouldn't I? I mean, I'm basically talking about, you know, eliminating um, a substantial part of their business. But the, but the reality is, is that it doesn't necessarily need to be in the mix. It isn't going to go away. You know, I've said publicly many times, you know, they're going to be soldering things to boards long after I've returned to my elemental form. So, you know, that's the way it goes. I can make a truce for it. In fact, I actually have some places where I see that solder works quite well. And I expect it to be uh, used on into the future for the manufacture of products. But it's a little bit like Peter Drucker, the American management you know, guru. Well, he actually was from Austria, but um, he uh, he said, you know, I, I capsulized him in one in one line. He said uh, that uh, you know the secret to good management is to put people in positions where they're and I'm capsulizing this, but where, where their strengths can be fully utilized and tapped, and whatever weaknesses they have don't matter. So the same thing. Is, is, is true in the realm of manufacturing and designing products. Do it. I, I said at a conference I had, I gave, and I'm sure somebody else had said these things. You know, there's like a lot of things that we, you know, you stick around and you say something and you think it's really clever and then you probably, you find it eventually. But I was giving a talk at an aerospace conference in Big Sky, Montana for the IEEE. And, and towards the end of my talk, this was about Occam, as I said, you know, the, the trick is, is to, First, do the right things and then do those things right. You know, you, you, you get no points, you know, for doing the wrong things right. And um, solder is to me, if you read any journals about electronics manufacturing, it is 
our number one enemy. We constantly fight it. There are 78 some odd solder, uh, lead free solders now. Does that make things simpler? No, and it makes it more complex. And the odd thing that I've also observed over time is that uh, increasing complexity is, is much easier than making things simpler. You know, just keep on adding things. And we're doing that in the realm of electronics today. And I just don't think it's, um, it's wise. But then on the other hand, I'm not in marketing. <laughs> Um, I'm I'm wondering because you you know you brought up the uh, you, you've you've brought up your opposition to to lead free solder. Um, did you get any pushback when you first came out against lead free solder? Were people you know saying, "Hey, this guy's crazy"? Did you get a lot of pushback about you know Joe Felstad hates the environment or anything crazy like that? Because I mean we. Today, if I think someone were to come out and and say we should pollute more, which is how that translates into, um, you know, they'd get crucified. But you know, I'm I'm wondering at the time uh, if coming out against lead free was you know received well, or was it still something at the time where there was enough uh, contention around whether you should even go lead free that people were just kind of accepting of of this viewpoint? Yeah, uh, it, it. Let's put it this way, I. I think it's one of those things, once you decide the ball starts to roll downhill, it's real hard to turn it around. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the Tin Research Institute was very, very influential to the European Parliament in terms of them getting to uh, promulgate this uh, ban. And the Tin Research Institute, not unsurprisingly, was uh, representing the tin industry. And if you suddenly go from, you know, 60% tin to 95% tin, what do you think that's going to do to the tin market? It's going to it's going to explode. And the price of tin did, you know, explode because of you know scarcity. So it was a great, a brilliant marketing move for the tin industry to to jump on the bandwagon, and then to tell you know the European parliamentarians who largely didn't understand anything, but everybody knew that lead was bad because it had a bad rep. So, you know, it was an easy thing to pile on to and say, yeah, let's do this, you know, and we'll get some brownie points, but without thinking it through. And even their own scientific community said, wait, let's do a full analysis on this. You know, Dr. Laura Turbini, who was at University of Toronto, I knew Laura when she was at uh, AT&T, uh, you know, again, another brilliant scientist. She did an analysis and said, no, there's nothing there. There's no there there. And, you know, there were things, legacy deposits of lead, you know, near mostly uh, lead producing sites where you could see some seepage of, of lead. But lead ions, uh, most common ions, soluble ions in, in, in uh, of, of everything is in chloride or sulfate. All right. Lead chloride is, is supposed to be, you know, I mean, everything that's a chloride is normally soluble, except lead, lead chloride, it's, it's insoluble. And lead sulfate is insoluble. You know, lead acetate- in, in water. In water, right. So in other words, leachate, if you're gonna say. So in water, in, in, but, but lead in, in acetate, you know, acetic acid, uh, vinegar, you know, dissolves quite nicely. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, if you get a little bit of acetate content, in fact, you know, the common name for lead acetate is lead sugar. And, and lead acetate was one of the things that was used in pigments in paint. And, and I can attest mm -hmm. as a kid, I know, because I used to have the occasion where I was eating lead chips, you know, because they were sweet. You know, you just a little pike every now and then to chew on a lead chip, you know. And, you know, and maybe that explains well, I don't my think craving. I've ever met anybody that admitted to that. <laughs> well, I, I, maybe it explains my craziness, but... You know, the reality is, is that, you know, it, the, the Romans that used, uh, kept their wine in lead vessels, right? And, it, and again, you know, the, that which turned to vinegar sweetened the wine. So they didn't know that they were damaging themselves. But it was, you know, that's what you get when you get knowledge. And, and the, 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 you use it, you put it to work. You know, we're not, hopefully not in stasis in our, our gaining of knowledge over time is that we're a, a, a learning beast and that we're continuing to grow on a, on a, on a upward path, not a, or a forward path rather than a backwards one. 
And for the most part, we are. We're doing a quite good job of it. And I'm just saying I'm, I'm a champion of progress. I just want to make sure that the progress is thought through. Sure, sure. I understand. Um, I, I think most people would say that's a reasonable position. But it seems the next stage of this is for you to go from saying, hey, maybe lead free doesn't make sense to why are we even bothering with solder at all? So how do you, I guess, in your thought process, how do you make that transition? Was this just one of those eureka moments while you're sitting down writing? That, that was it. You know, I mean, again, with the emphasis. The other thing I should say in all of this is that when I was at Tessera, you know, I started to make a, a pitch. We were, we were looking at these chip scale packages and everything was, was basically a ball grid array. So we were very early in the ball grid array and the area array. In fact, one of my early patents was presaged what was required for being able to make a QFM. And, you know, it has now citations and well over 550 patents, I think now. So, you know, it was, it was fundamental in terms of what made it work. And so I've always been an advocate. And I remember when I met with the, I, I showed it to John Smith, who was one of the founders of Dallas Semiconductor and then the president of Tesla and Doc, Tom DeStefano, who was the founder of Tesla. And I showed him what I was thinking of. They said, eh, it's kind of an interesting idea. It's, you know, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and file. I, I said to him at the time, I said, I don't think this is good for everything. I, I, but I do think it's good for about 90, 95% of things. And that still holds true today, is that QFNs are the most fundamental push, you know, uh, uh, package there is out there in terms of the numbers, that, the call outs, it's, it's, it's the default. Um, but back to the area array is that I, we were talking about the ball grid array for the, for the chip scale package. And then, it, you know, I, I went with a, colleague at the time, Vern Solberg, who a lot of people know is, you know, the design for assembly activity. And Vern, I brought Vern into Tessera. And uh, uh, so he made some tremendous contributions to the industry in there, although that he had made some pretty decent contributions before that at SCI. But um, I, I, I asked Vern, I said, look, you know, you're a designer, would you do me a favor? I'm going to go down to the store and pick up a bunch of Legos and I want you, you know, a base. And would you create a, a, a Legos module for me? You know, and um, I can provide you with a picture of that. And it just basically it's something to look at as, as to what a Legos module, that everything's on grid, that the layout becomes extremely simple. And that is what I, I, I approached. And most designers, you know, Mike Buto you know, was del delighted me with an invitation to give a, a, a talk at PCB East about this Occam mm -hmm. thing when it first came out. And so I had I was talking to a room full of designers. And when I talked about these things, I mean, I saw a room full of nodding heads. You know, yeah, this makes sense. I, I get it. I get it. But the, the, the problem that they had was, that, you know, I can design it, but who's going to build it? And then, mm -hmm. you know, manufacturers looked at it and they go, well, you know, I can, I'm, maybe I can build it, but, but who's going to design it? And so there's this chicken and egg thing that I'm still wrestle with. Most designers get it. And most, you know, Happy Holden, you know, continues to think that, you know, it has a place. It doesn't, doesn't need to be for everything. It absolutely doesn't need to be for everything, but it can be for a lot of things. And it can make uh, a, a products that will be at once, you know, cheaper, better performing, lighter, more environmentally friendly. And, and you know, I, I, and I don't know what, you know, ec ec ecologically better. I mean, I just say, I, I, maybe I just repeating myself, but, you know, the thing is, is a litany of, of benefits that I've written and provided in my simple little book called uh, Chip Scale Packaging for Modern Electronics. And so it's there for people to, uh, uh, no, that's not the right path. Learn. It is a solderless assembly for electronics, the safe approach. So that book is out there. I'm sorry. I'm, I had another book that I've written. So I've, you know, I mean, I've, I've written a bunch of them. In fact, my, I'm rewriting right now my uh, flexible circuit technology. I'm going to the fifth edition. So, you know, wow. it, you know it's um, a lot of writing um, with the help of a lot of good people from, you know, across the world. Um, but 
you know, it, it's just sharing the knowledge is, is what it's all about at the end of the day and getting others to, to, to think about it. You know, I, I brought a little tchotchke here is that, you know, when I say, you know, that things can be simple, this is a little a daisy chain and this is aluminum. And you can see the, the, the packages, little daisy chain parts there. And those are all just connected. And the beauty of this is that all the things that, you know, the industry fights against, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> like, um, uh, you know, concerns about peel strength and, and uh, you know, the, the, the material things, the, the things that we have to do in order to accommodate solder, you know, they all disappear. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like I argue is that I've never seen anybody shake the components off a, off a circuit board. You know, you don't need to worry about that. When they're all embedded, you know, uh, I've never seen anybody shake the circuits off a circuit board, forgive me. Um, and so if you put everything embedded, then the, the concerns about high peel strength and the like you know, disappear. It's all just basically, it's just a, a board. And you go from drop test to throw test. You could even... <laughs> You, you can even embed batteries into the structure, right? Which is something that you cannot do if you're going to run it through a heavy duty thermal process, right? Is it the sure, batteries, yeah. you know, because the batteries will explode. So, mm -hmm. you know, I say it just lo opens doors to a lot of really interesting things that we do not uh, presently consider. We know that you can't do it. That's, I had a, and I've, I've had a couple of people who really, really got this, you know, that are really eager. And one was a guy from aerospace who was, after I did a little presentation, he said, this is a great idea. I want to do it with you. He says, you're not trying to, you know, uh, defy gravity. And uh, he uh, said, look, I've got to go in for some, this was early on. He says, I'm going to work with you. I want you to come in. We'll work this. We'll build some of these things. And then unfortunately, uh, he went in for some surgery and never came out. And uh, more, oh, that's more unfortunate. Yeah, more recently, another <laughs> another uh, uh, advocate for the idea who was someone who got it, it was a really excellent designer uh, named Darren Smith, absolutely brilliant designer. You know, who unfortunately, you know, he, he loved it, and he was going to write a design guide for it. You know, and, and unfortunately, Darren, um, you know, had a life with a lot of you know. Uh, from early injuries from his infancy and the rest of it, and had some some problems. I mean, he was an eclectic, brilliant, you know, delightful person to character, one of the characters to talk to, one of the more, you know, diverse in terms of his interest, you know, an autodidact. He could, he, he learned it all, he knew it all, and he knew it better than anybody. And unfortunately, the, the you know, the pain, that, you know, physical and mental pain that, you know, was delivered on his doorstep over his life finally took him out and uh, so I lost him, you know, last month and, uh, you know, irreplaceable because you cannot purchase enthusiasm. You know, you cannot, yeah. you can't, you can't, you can't go and say, I want to go buy somebody's enthusiasm. Either they got it or they don't. Some people had it, you know, but then again, you know, the reality of their own business uh, sets in real quickly. You know, I think Joe O'Neill, who was the president of, of Hunter Tech early on said, right when there was a news announcement about this project, you know, he called me on the phone. He says, you know, I've been sitting on both of these technologies, assembly and printed circuit technology in one building. I never put the two together, you know. And, you know, although he was advocate, you know, he had a business to run and he had money to make. And, you know, not everybody, not in this industry has time for R&D. So yeah. my conundrum. My conundrum. So you, you brought up uh, something that I think uh, some designers might be familiar with, which is this you know concept where in an Occam process uh, PCBA, all of the components are essentially embedded, is what it sounds like. Um, it, it's what, what types of devices do you see the Occam process being really best for? Because, I mean, listen, if it's the... Uh, Maybe if it's the circuit board that goes in your toaster, which is something I've joked with, you know, another yep. uh, uh, industry person about, you know, does it make sense to do this more advanced process versus, you know, the next generation smartphone? Where and, where does the Occam process sit? And and that's the beauty of it. It is, you know, I talk again. I talk about simplicity, right? Mm -hmm. You know, 
It, it, things should not be multiplied unnecessarily. All right. And when you go to the Occam process, and, and again, there's a, a, a description in the book, you know, where there's a comparison side by side with the Occam process, uh, potential and traditional manufacturing. Number of manufacturing steps drop by a factor of, uh, I think, like third. You know, in other words, most of them related to the soldering process. The material count. Darren did a redesign of a product. I said, Darren, take a design that you've done. It's, you know, nobody's going to get their knickers in a twist if they see it, you know, on the, on the board. And they probably wouldn't be able to recognize it anyway. But, um, and then redesign it, you know, but don't go to DigiKey and look for components. I want you to pretend like every one of the components you need. The centerpiece was a 441 IO FPGA. And I said, so, and it was like 0.8 millimeter pitch. I said, well, pretend that it's at 0.5. All right, and then make all the other components 0.5 and make sure that all of their terminations land on that 0.5 grid. All right, and then do a layout and see what you get. Well, the layer, the, 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 the board went from, I think it was 170 by 140 millimeters down to I think something like 70, 30. And then Darren thought, well, I'm going to make it into a rigid flex so that the thing could be folded up even smarter, smaller. And the layer count went from 12 to 6, all right? Now, that's cheaper, all right? Mm -hmm. And in many cases, when you get on, on grid, I think that the design counts will, layer counts could be, you know, immensely simpler. There are ways, you know, you don't need to necessarily abandon through holes. There are ways to factor them into the structure, all right? And in fact, there may be ways to incorporate some of the traditional manufacturing of printed circuits back into the Occam assembly. But for most of the components, most of the, the structures that are out there, um, it, is, it is easy. The, the, the problem is, is that uh, I'm trying to give wings to designers, right? I've, I've often mm -hmm. said, I've often said, you know, in my just talks to designers, when I know the audience is mostly designers, I said, you people lead the parade. You are the ones, the drum majors. Is, is that, you know, however you, you know, wherever you take us, we go, all right? You know, I hope, and it, I hope that you would understand the importance of your understanding manufacturing so that you can take us to the places where we ought to go. Well, that's, that's interesting you say that because I, I think the, the narrative so much, uh, especially ever since I started, uh, you know, working in the industry was DFM, DFM, DFM. You know, designers are beholden in some ways to the manufacturer because, you know, CAD tools are great. They let you pretty much do whatever you want until you take it over to, you know, a manufacturing uh, house. Yeah. And, you know, the fabricator says, well, no, we can't build that. No bid. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, to that end, I guess a year and a half ago or thereabouts, I, I saw that problem, too. And I wrote a, one of my columns was titled Designing with Manufacturing not designing for manufacturing. In Are you words, taking credit for coining the term design with manufacturing? I don't know if I, I never saw it beforehand, but I just said, you know, I, <laughs> GWN, I wrote it down, designing with manufacturing and defining for. You know, it's something that we advocated for 40 years. When I was at Printed Circuit Builders, we used to train our customers. We used to give a, an understanding of manufacturing. We did it every month we had people come in you know who were designers who were material suppliers who even other manufacturers came in to listen to our little lectures on how to build the printed circuit and with a, including a tour of the shop and we told them where the pain was all right so in other words conceptually it's very old you know but you know we had all these dfs and i said no it's dw you know dwm and uh and so you know i'm not going to you know, stake it as my thing. I just hadn't seen it before, but I saw that it was something that needed to be said and needed to be brought to the to the fore. And you know, hopefully that's being got. But I say, as I say, the designers drive this ship, whether or not they realize it, right? And the decisions that they make have really, really profound implications on everything else that happens downstream. And I love well, them. We <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when I was talking with uh, Amit Ball um, uh, earlier episode of the podcast, he he had mentioned that designers should not be afraid to maybe push their manufacturer a little bit out of their comfort zone and push the limits of their their traditional capabilities. Yeah. And it sounds like you are advocating for that, and it's maybe even a designer's responsibility to do that because if designers aren't doing that. Or what's going to drive the manufacturers to innovate? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I had, again, at Print and Circuit Builders, we used to, you know, when I went there, it was a small, mostly, you know, multi-layer, uh, you know, double-sided multi-layer, a couple, you know, four-layer boards. So it's very, very simple in terms of its of its uh, manufacturing technology. But, you know, with the with the consent of, you know, Lee Mueller, who was the owner, I said, you know, let's do some, let me let me have some fun here. Let's do some different stuff. I mean, I did it at Boeing. You know, I, I saved Boeing, you know, in one year, you know, I think I got credit for saving $7 million, you know, which when $7 million was a lot of money, you know, and, and it was all about changing things. I built, you know, odd things, you know, EMP grids for window, uh, for windows for the AWACS and E4B. You know, I took a process that was at, you know, like a, like a, Five percent to like ninety-eight percent in terms of its yield, um, and wow. I did it. I did it off the books. In other words, I I didn't even get funded for it. I just said, "Here, let's try this," and we did it. And you know, the the Air Force was extremely extremely happy. But so I I carried some of that over with with Lee, and said, "Let me let me see what it is." So we became you know a, a place for orphan work. In other words, whenever there was something that somebody couldn't do or didn't think they could do. I'd say, hand it over to us. Let's see what we can do. So I worked with people. We'd work out a process. And then I got them into flexible circuits and rigid flex. Um, and then we did all kinds of odd things. Had all the national labs, you know, would come in with an Escher drawing and say, I'd like this in 3D, please. And and then you go, well, that's interesting. Let's see what we can do. Yeah. And and then figure out how to how to solve their problem. In other words, can we move this? Can we do that? And uh, do some, some really, really surprising things. It was a lot of fun. So uh, in in this process um, where you're essentially, you know, building up around components, um, you, you had mentioned that um, someone you had worked with, you had suggested that they take a, an existing design and redesign it to be essentially yep. an Occam PCBA. Yep. But you said... Don't go to DigiKey and start looking at components. Are it, right. are we to interpret that as to mean that the Occam process can't be used with traditional off-the-shelf components, or is it only with landless, you know, QFNs? Well, yeah, yeah, the ideal product. This is, by the way, this is another cost saving. Is that I'm because I worked in IC packaging, and I know that all those mm -hmm. packages, you know, most of the packages still today are lead frame. All right, and. QFNs are a significant portion of that. The problem is, is there was, you know, when Japan got into the industry uh, or surface mount back to the 80s, let's go back and see where we, where the wheels went off the rails. Um, with with uh, peripheral heated devices, you know, the QFNs and the like, um, the, the, the problem was, is that, you know, they needed to shrink it. They needed, they knew that they wanted to make the next version smaller. And so they developed what they called the 80% rule. And the 80% rule says that every new pitch must be 80% of the previous pitch. And of course, from a, a, a logic standpoint, well, if there's no bounds and there's no order, then it doesn't matter, all right? It could be anything. But then you start having to burn off a lot of layers to take care of the redistribution wiring. And this is what you see. I mean, when you start mixing pitches, of multiple types of parts, you know, you can see how you, you probably know that you go, ah, I wish this was, you know, or maybe I, if I would have gotten this one on this pitch and instead of this pitch, you know, or with this pad out instead of that pad out, what, how much better design might I have been able to have? But, you know, a lot of times you get whatever purchasing throws at you. And remember purchasing, you know, to paraphrase uh, Oscar Wilde, he said, you know, a, 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 a cynic is someone who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. And unfortunately, that's true for purchasing agents too, many of them. 
you know, they know how much something costs, but they don't really understand the value. They don't know what the impact is throughout the manufacturing cycle. And so at the end of the day, you get less than you could have had or you paid more for it. So um, the, the, the key in all of this is to be able to have a, 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 a standard grid pitch, make conscious decisions. And this is the other thing I said, is that have come to the realization is that it is, when I said earlier, it's more different, much more difficult to make things simple than it is to make them complex. In other words, you have mm -hmm. to put much more thought into what you do. The payoffs at the end, right? Sure. But, you, you know, it doesn't, it's, it's not exciting. It's not expedient. And, you know, well, I realize, you know, com go ahead. I was going to say complexity has, has uh, diminishing returns as well. But it's sexy, you know, when you look at the, the way that a lot of, <laughs> I mean, look at look at how complex this thing is, you know, nobody can do this. We did it, you know, you know, IBM made their their mainframes, as I understand it, they made their mainframes really as complex as they could in a lot of ways in terms of their manufacturing processes. And they did that because they had to go out on bid. And that anybody who's going to bid to try and build one of those mainframes was going to have to reproduce IBM. And then everything got no bid. It's a great way to lock yourself into it. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, like space shuttles and like all these other things. And, you know, SpaceX, however, you know, they, they threw a curveball at this and decided that, you know, with a smaller team and a little more control under one roof, that you can do things more thoughtfully. And they've done a great job with that. You know, I'm not a great fan of Elon Musk for a lot of reasons, but I do like what he did with, uh, uh, I mean, with Tesla, he did a great job too. I mean, he was just a, a will, force of will. And the same thing with SpaceX. SpaceX has done some amazing things. So, you know, he's, he's, doing, he's doing good things with his lots of money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, as I think about how this all works, because it, it sounds like, you know, you're, you're basically building the board around the chip and the circuitry around the chip, whatever that chip may be. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm starting to wonder if maybe, sorry, sorry. you know, you're going to get bypassed by 3D printing because 3D printing and even like newer systems that might integrate an assembly step might be able to actually do the same thing without solder because they're literally printing all of those circuits around a component. And it seems like, you know, I, I guess you might worry that the Occam process might become obsolete because of that. No, in nope. fact, I, I, I wrote that up. You know, I described that in my writing. It's described in my book as to how to build that. In fact, there are ways to be able to do that cheaper than printing. All right. But printing is, is the, the advantage. In fact, I, I said, you know, it's possible to build a machine that would sit in the corner that would allow you. In fact, I was talking to uh, Ray Prasad uh, you know, this is 15 years ago, Ray, I've known, Ray and I worked together at Boeing, so I've known him for a long time, but he was uh, sponsoring or uh, repping Beamworks, which was an Israeli company that had a small footprint uh, assembly, uh, you know, uh, operation with pick and place and soldering, using lasers to solder. And you just put in a board and it comes and pick, if you had the full bomb, you put all the pones down and the rest of it. I said, this would be really great for being able to build an Occam type assembly. You just flip it out. You're gonna to have to build everything upside down and then do the printing. Mm -hmm. And again, remember I was talking about doing printing at, at, at Elf Technologies, we were using uh, catalytic toners and, and laser printers to print you know, uh, circuits directly onto a, a, a rolling substrate. And then you know, at that time we went to uh, SRI. Unfortunately, the, the, the company didn't survive the, the, the uh, um, they always credited me. I was a consultant for them. They always credited me with getting them funded because I gave them the idea that they need, could, could do things roll to roll and they thought they wanted to do it in sheet form. And uh, so that made all the difference. So we were doing the first of this is 1990 or 91, 90. And um, so, you know, the, the inkjet printing, you know, became an inspiration. We talked to SRI. And so a lot of the things that, you know, I've been involved in, you know, at the early stages, you see finally making their way in. That doesn't take anything away from the creative creativity of the people who actually brought it to, 
you know, wrestled it to ground, but the concepts have been there. You know, I was talking about an inline manufacturing operation in 1974 and said, here's how you can do it. And at that time, by the way, everything was on grid too, but the grid was 100 mil centers, you know, which is the way everything was, you know, before you got in the industry. It was, everything was all dips, all 100 mil centers. And it just mm -hmm. made sense, just made sense. Yeah, I, you know, going from dips to, you know, basically everything being surface mount and a lot of those components being landless has, I think, enabled the complexity uh, that might be needed in some devices, but then it creates this challenge with manufacturing and that, of course, drives higher costs. And, you know, you have to wonder if that has also contributed to some of the pressure to offshore to keep those costs down so that everybody can be competitive. Yeah, I, I said, one of the first things I said, you know, at the time, I saw the departure of manufacturing from the U.S. and I went, hmm, I think we're down to 200 shops. When I was at, at Printed Circuit Builders in Mountain View, not Printed Circuit Builders, but uh, Printex in Mountain View 50 years ago, there were more circuit shops than there were gas stations on corners. And, and it was because it, wow. was an e it was an easy business to get into. It was a real easy business to get into very labor intensive, you know, but it didn't cost much, you know, a few plastic trash cans and a, you know, drill press and, you know, you're off, you're in business. It was really, really simple. The features were coarse enough to be able to do that. But, you know, I say it's evolved quite a mm -hmm. bit from that time. Um, you know, now it's, you know, probably $10 million at least to get into manufacturing, you know, relatively simple, well, revenue center of gravity boards. But, it, but you know, everything needs to be um, how should I see a reassess? So I don't know how I got off on that track, but uh, you made a comment. But 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 the reality is is that it 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 can be much simpler than what we do. It's a matter of will, you know. It's a matter of desire. Uh, I have interest from you know uh, the Navy uh, at their facility at Crane. I you know did some work with the the folks at Bucharest Polytechnic. I gave a talk in Timisoara, uh, Romania, uh, 12 years ago, something like that. And one of the a, a, a researchers or a, a professor from Bucharest Polytechnic was in the audience. He came up to me afterwards. He says, this really makes sense. We want to do this. I said, great. You know, so we've been in contact. So after all these things, it fits and starts. The problem is, is getting them. But they got some funding from the EU. And and that with that funding, they had a product a project that, I think, um, trying to remember the, the, the name of it. it, was a relatively simple name, but anyway, they just finally completed it. It was an Occam type assembly, solderless assembly. You know, they put their own spin on it. That's great, you know, but they were limited in terms of the equipment that they had. So it was printing uh, a technology and, uh, you know, it had some good help from Tatsuda and Japan in terms of the, providing the inks and the rest of it. And it worked. And the idea was build a little uh, uh, a parking spot uh, sensor so that, you know, you bury it in the ground and then it would, you know, be able to uh, tell if you've got a big magnetic beast sitting above it and sense and be able to send a signal uh, to something that says, hey, there's somebody sitting in this place. So a very simple concept, but it's a demonstrator. And there was a uh, there's some folks from Spain and some folks from Hungary were involved in it. So that's been done. And um, so it, the, there are bits and pieces of it starting today. So, you know, I'm still s just seeing the germination of this in a few spots. Say it's been incredibly frustrating. As I said, if I had been working at printed circuit builders and come up with this idea in 1982 or 83, I would have been done in a matter of just a few weeks. You know, I have had some help from some people along the way, you know, uh, uh, Nilesh Nalik at uh, Eagle Circuits helped very early on with his people. We did some stuff around Christmas. In fact, you know, I credit Nilesh and his people with helping to build this, you know, taking things that were essentially processed consumables and turn them into substrates. Aluminum is really cheap. It's really mm -hmm. dimensionally stable. It's a good thermal spreader. You know, uh, it's so it's all the things that we want in our manufacturing in our manufactured product you just build it all in and yeah. so it's it's doable it's doable and, and you know now now that i i i 
after listening to you and, and after, you know, kind of thinking about how the process works where you're basically like plating up the back of the, the, uh, the components or the bottom side of the components and then kind of building it up layer by layer, I can actually see how this type of at least thought process of, uh, constructing a PCBA this way, um, could be compatible with something, you know, more advanced like 3d printing. And maybe they aren't necessarily going to be, you know, the, the, having these yeah. guys bypass you, you know, by yeah. or anything like this. No, they are not, they are not exclusive. It, it's, it's in, it, sure. in terms of, of, in terms of the way it is. Cause you know, if you start as an aluminum substrate and you do your build up on the aluminum substrate <laughs> and I'm not being paid by the aluminum industry, by the way, you know, it just, <laughs> it just happens to be, you know, a beautiful element and it's, you know, uh, I think 8.3% of the Earth's crust. So we're never going to run out of it. And uh, it's recyclable and nobody's on nobody's environmental hit list. Uh, so it's, you know, CTE is pretty close to that of copper, which is one of the things we were looking at when you're developing packages. You know, the IC packages, they tried to get something that would be close to uh, it, it's, it's differentiating. This is the thing is heat is the enemy of electronics. It is at the end of the game. It's when you start packing things really close together, you generate a lot of heat. And if you look at how much heat that these things are putting together now, you go, that's crazy. You know, how can they possibly build something that has a, 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 a heat flux that's about that equivalent to that on the, the surface of the sun? you know, in terms of watts per, you know, square centimeter or something. It's just, it's nuts. And I don't... Well, that's that's funny you bring that up because I'm, I'm now reminded of Pat Gelsinger's comment back when he was, I think, CEO, uh, CTO of Intel in the early 2000s, where he said, you know, if you scale up the current architecture, the amount of heat generated by these components would be comparable to a nuclear reactor. He said something to that, that effect. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it is, and that there's a brilliance of this. You know, one of my advisors is Bernie Siegel, who is uh, Thermal Solutions. I think Bernie's, you know, been around for every, always a chairman of Semitherm. And when I showed the idea to Bernie, Bernie said, the, this is amazing. This is an opportunity to solve the thermal problems on the front end rather than the back end. And he said, you know, because thermal mm -hmm. issues have always been a stepchild, you know, don't worry about it, you know, let the thermal guys figure it out, you know, and to their credit, they do. And the people that are developing heat pipes and all the other really, really exotic technologies, you know, you look inside of a, one of those gaming computers, which, by the way, is another irony is that the, the highest performing computers in the world today are all in the hands of gamers, you know, the, the you know, go figure, you know, but that's where it is, you know, and what they've done is amazing, but it's not making the world a better place, at least in my opinion, or maybe I'm just too high minded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can now I can now imagine building up a printed circuit board on the back of like an aluminum heat sink. So just like you say, you've, you've taken care of the thermal pro pro uh, problem on the front end by yeah. literally putting the electronics on there and just building around it. Well, and, and, the, and the other thing that, you know, it's, it's proximity is that the other thing that I was saying, being, being able to, you know, the accommodations we make to the manufacturing process in terms of the placement of components, you know that you're not allowed to get them closer than a certain distance to each other, or often because you have to be able to clean or you have to, mm -hmm. with an anticipation that you're going to have to remove them, right? I'm saying, why are you, why are you planning? I, I don't even want, I mean, I'm not more heresy. I don't, I want to get away with, get away from test. In other words, except for burning in the components, all right? And knowing mm -hmm. it on the front end and then do the rest of the process right. Solder is a weak process. You know, we constantly have to concern ourselves with a, with a, a latent solder joint failure. But the micro via technology has gotten very good, you know, is that they know how to build these things. They've been tested up the kazoo and they're continued to put. And when you look at ice, how much real estate you get back if you can if you don't have to circumvent a pad. All right. Think about think about it. Is it if it's if if you just build up little tiny connections on the surface of it, it looks like a filigree. 
you know, it would look like mm -hmm. a, a, a modern circuit board could look like the top of, a, of an IC chip under a microscope, you know, but the components are beneath it all, all right? Much the way the transistors are beneath all that redistribution wiring, you know, on a chip today. It's just a scale. Mm -hmm. It's just a scale. And, and the trick, you know, that I, I had when I showed this to, to uh, uh, another friend of mine, former, he was a founder of uh, um, uh, Kevin Grundy, you know, uh, he was uh, ma ran manufacturing for Next for Steve Jobs. And uh, yeah, really, really clever. He also started Telocity, which I think became part of the role up for DirecTV. Anyway, he was, a, he was actually my CTO at, or CEO at uh, Silicon Pipe, brought him in for that. And he got really enthused about the ideas and he had some money and so he made a small investment with the rest of us and we had from, we had some fun. But when I showed him the Occam idea and the rest of it, he says, this is really great. It's, you know, it's the ability to build uh, a potential ability to build a product with not the most transistors possible, but the least transistors possible. In other words, give the designer an opportunity to build the most efficient design that they can possibly imagine to get the job done. Right, that would use the least amount of energy, and then let them let them have at it. You know, it's like chiplets. You know, I started, I wrote an article ten years ago, I think of, I think somewhere around ten years ago, where I talked about disintegrating the IC, and then breaking it into IP blocks, and putting those IP blocks in packages that are tested and burned in, and then let the designer have at it. You know, the mm -hmm. the the let them figure out what it is that needs. You know. You have you pick a, a, a you pick an IC on a, up from DigiKey or somebody else, and it has a particular IP block that you want to use in your design, and you, so you use it. But guess what? You have to wire up everything else as well, right? Mm -hmm. And then if something isn't connected, then you know you got grief, and it's just crazy, you know. So why not let them design with IP blocks, you know, Lego blocks? that are all on a standard grid and let them figure out what it is that they need. And they become the IC designer because really the printed circuit was the first integrator of circuits, you know, little transistors on a printed circuit. And so we come full circle. I say, it's time to rethink our roots and say, why not? You know, some uh, George Bernard Shaw, it's, it's, you know, some people look at, at things as they are and ask why. And I look at things as they never were and ask why not. You know, <laughs> Kennedy stole that, by the way, for his inaugural speech and didn't credit for Shaw. But <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, I think that's a great note to, to end on because um, this is really a, a new way to imagine assembly, and, and I think it opens up so many different possibilities. And you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that the convergence between maybe some more advanced assembly technologies and this thought process that goes into the Occam process can kind of come together and give designers more ways to create advanced technology. And Joe, I want to thank you so much for joining us. This has been a really enlightening discussion. And um, just thinking about how this all works, it's you know opened up my mind. And I hope uh, everyone who's watching will check out some of the show notes and they can look at some of your articles, maybe uh, one of your books, and um, sure. they'll be able to learn learn a lot more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you mind if we put your LinkedIn profile on there as well and can connect with you? Well, sure. No, that's fine. I, I post a lot of things there. I've been helping other people. I've been recently helping a local friend with a, a technology for making hydrogen a real solution. So uh, <laughs> for I've had some fun. Unfortunately, the inventor we I met at a local bar we used to sit down. He was another refugee from Silicon Valley. Unfortunately, he passed away. So I'm, you know, I'm on a road as uh, you know, looking to shuffle off that mortal coil myself as, at some point in time. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, sometime further down the future. Sure, sure. Well, thank you again so much for, for being here. This has been really enlightening. And um, to everybody who's watching out there, make sure to hit the subscribe button on YouTube uh, to catch all of the future episodes that we have coming out. And um, I want to thank everybody for sticking around and listening to this very enlightening talk. And last but not least, don't stop learning, stay on track, and we'll see you for the next episode.